Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, all right. All right, so isn't it so much fun to hear about all these exciting experimental things that may be coming to Angular? This is like one of my favorite parts of ng-conf, getting to hear about all this exciting technology. But at the same time, I think it is equally important to take the time to focus on fundamentals. And to that end, I am going to be talking about TypeScript decorators today. Now, this is a topic that I think that everybody has at least a little bit of familiarity with, right? We all use decorators in our work in Angular. But I'm guessing that many of us have not had the opportunity to sit down and take a look at how decorators work underneath the hood. So that's what we're going to be doing today. So we're going to be starting off with something familiar here. This is our component decorator from Angular. It comes from Angular Core, so we import it in. And we uh, use it to mark a class as a component class. So here we are passing in some metadata about how we want our component to act and look. We tell Angular what selector we want to use for our component, where to find our template and style files, maybe what change detection strategy we want to use. And then we wrap that all up in an object and we pass it into our component decorator. Now, how do we know that this is a decorator? Well, the telltale sign is that it's prefixed with an at symbol. And then we have the name of our decorator component. And we may be passing some arguments into the parentheses after that. And finally, it's, it's placed on top of or in front of whatever we're decorating, in this case, our app component. So what are some interesting use cases for why we want to create a decorator of our own, a custom decorator in our application? Well, we could use decorators to configure property descriptors, which gives us fine-grained control over our object properties. We could wrap and apply useful Lodash utilities, like memoize or debounce or throttle. Or we could enforce a required parameter, throwing an error if that parameter is not passed in. And all of these things can be done in a clean and easy to understand fashion, which is the real win here. So now that we've seen some examples, let's take a look at how we would actually implement a decorator of our own. First thing we want to do, as we do when we're writing any code, is figure out why we want to use this decorator. So my purpose here is I want to create a decorator that's not configurable, so I just want to put it on top of the method that I'm decorating, not passing any arguments into it. And this decorator is going to, every time that method is called, it's going to announce what method was called, the class that it was on, and any arguments that were passed into it. So as a, an example uh, piece of code here, I have a planet class. And my planet class has a method greet. My greet method takes a couple of arguments, and it just console logs out a greeting for me. I'm going to instantiate my planet class, and then I'll call mars.greet and a greeting as an argument, welcome to, and I'm going to say it loud, true. So what, when we run this code, should we see in our output? And this is the output that we're expecting down below here. First thing on line one of the output is our decorator, uh, what is produced by our decorator. It says calling planet.greet with our argument map. And then we're going to actually run our method. So it'll say, welcome to Mars. So how are we going to build this decorator? Here we have our decorator definition. The part that's highlighted here is our decorator wrapper. First thing that you're going to notice is that it's just a function. We don't have any particularly special syntax here. We're just defining a function with a particular signature. So because we are dealing with a method decorator here, we are passing in three arguments. The first one is the target. That is our planet class. And the second one is a string that represents the name of our method. That's going to be greet in our example. And the final thing is our descriptor. And that is some metadata about our method. 
And uh, for the purposes of this decorator, we can think about our descriptor as a way that we're going to gain access to our method so that we can actually manipulate it a little bit. In the body of our decorator, first thing we're going to do is store our original method, and then we're going to replace it with a wrapper function. And that wrapper function is going to take note of the name of the class and then stringify the arguments. And then it's going to call console log and say calling planet.greet with our argument map. The final thing we need to do with this decorator is make sure we call our original method. So we're using apply to apply the arguments to our original method. And then we're going to return the result and return the descriptor just in case we need to use those or access them somewhere down the line. And an interesting thing to note here is that this is kind of a wrapper, right? And wrappers are actually a pretty common pattern for method decorators. Oftentimes what we want to do is add some logic to the top or the bottom of the method, and so we do that. And uh, that would be an example of like how you would create a timing decorator, something that would time a function, or use throttle or debounce. Cool, so now that we've taken a look at how we implement them, let's take a step back and think about what TypeScript decorators actually are, and get a definition in here. And we can say that TypeScript decorators are a way to observe, modify, and replace class declarations and members. So we can apply decorators in TypeScript to classes, properties, methods, accessors such as get and set, and parameters like constructor arguments or method arguments. And if we want to get even more abstract here, we can say that decorators are a way to provide annotations and a metaprogramming syntax to classes and class members. Now, what does that mean? This is a definition straight out of the TypeScript documentation. And what it's really getting at is that decorators are a way that we can describe our data. So think back to the first example, the component class, or the, excuse me, the component decorator that we saw earlier. Using the component decorator, we were describing our component to Angular. It's a very declarative approach to programming. If we have any programming polyglots in the audience, which I'm sure we do, um, you may recognize the descriptions here as similar to data annotations in C-sharp or annotations in Java. So these are ways that we can assert type information in those languages, and that is also a valid use of decorators. If you're familiar with the decorator pattern in programming, you might be wondering if this is an implementation of that pattern. Now, this is a pattern that's used in statically typed languages such as C or C++. And in those languages, it allows us to modify the behavior of a single object without modifying the behavior of all the objects of the same class. And what we're looking at here is actually different. So what we're looking at is a language feature that comes to the world of JavaScript from Python. And this language feature allows us to add functionality to classes and class members at definition time. So the changes that we make are going to be applied to every instance of that class. So I mentioned that it comes to the world of JavaScript, right? So are we talking about JavaScript decorators and TypeScript decorators being the same thing? And we are, kind of, kind of. There are some nuances to that conversation. So TypeScript compiles to JavaScript, right? And a lot of the power of TypeScript is that when we compile to JavaScript, we are getting features that may not be available natively in the language yet. And when we're doing that with decorators, uh, we have to keep in mind that decorators are still a stage two TC39 proposal, which means they're still in a draft format. They haven't been implemented natively in, uh, in ECMAScript yet. And in fact, they've been there for a while, and they're, they've been revised since the original implementation and when TypeScript implemented them. And so 
my point here is that I, I want to make sure everybody knows that the version of decorators that eventually makes it into ECMAScript or JavaScript may be different, will probably be different than the version that we see in TypeScript today. One final piece of sort of side information that I want to talk about here is about property descriptors. And I think that property descriptors are super cool. They are a language feature of JavaScript, not TypeScript. And property descriptors are metadata about our object properties. So this is stuff like whether or not the property can be changed, whether the property can be deleted, whether it shows up in a for in loop. And all of this metadata is being attached to your object properties, whether you know you're creating it or not. So at the top here, I have an example of just using regular assignment to create a property. And when I do that, all of these, uh, all of these metadata, all of these descriptors, are by default true. So you can change the property, and you can delete it. But if, you, if I use object.define property, I have more control over that. So I can make it so that somebody can't delete a property or, can't, or it won't show up in a for in loop. And the reason why I mention this is because there are quite a few examples of decorators that take advantage of this metadata to uh, have fine-grained control. So I'll show you a couple examples here. <laughs> So first thing we're going to look at is a read-only decorator. And this is another method decorator. And this decorator is going to be placed on methods that I don't want anybody to change after they've been defined. So the decorator is really simple. We, say, we see the same signature that we saw before with a target key and descriptor being passed in. And the only thing that this decorator is going to do is it's going to change the writable property descriptor to false. And then it'll just return the descriptor like it did before. So here's an example of how we might test out our decorator. We have an example class moon. And our example class has a circumference, um, a circumference method. And our circumference method has the formula for a circumference, and we don't want to change that, right? That's a pretty fixed formula. So we'll apply our read-only decorator, and we'll instantiate our moon. And down here below, just to try things out, we're going to try and change circumference to point at an arrow function that just returns 100. We don't want this to be possible. And when we run this code, our output will be a type error. Cannot assign to read-only property circumference of object moon. So we've successfully prevented changing that property. So what happens if we want to pass in a parameter to our decorator? Well, if we want to pass in a parameter, all we need to do is change the syntax slightly to use something called a decorator factory. And what this means is we're going to be passing in any parameters that we need in our decorator into the outer function. And then we're going to return the function that's going to be used as our decorator at runtime. So that function is going to have the same signature that we saw before with the target key and descriptor. And then inside our decorator here, we're changing the enumerable property descriptor to point at the value that was passed in. And the point of this decorator, by the way, is to make it so that um, a property will show up in a for in loop or won't show up in a for in loop, depending on, uh, depending on the, uh, what, whatever you pass in. <laughs> when we want to test out this code, we're going to use our moon class again. And Something interesting to note here is that uh, I'm assuming that we have a ES2016 compile target here in which methods are not enumerable by default. So if I did a foreign loop without using my enumerable decorator, I would only see uh, in, my, my in my class instance here, in my moon instance, I would only see the radius. But if I use the enumerable decorator and I pass in true, then when I do a foreign loop, Here's the results. I see not only my radius, but also my circumference here. 
So I haven't had enough time to go over like as many examples as I would love to in this um, in this talk, but I have lots of great resources here for you to check out. Some of them are TypeScript resources, and some of them are uh, ECMAScript, and the ones down below here are specific to learning more about decorators in Angular. They're all fabulous. Um, I am the newest member of Narwhal, and um, as you start any job, you have to ramp up, right? You have this learning period, and um, I feel really fortunate with this job in that all of my colleagues have written blog posts and produced videos and had all kinds of like great content. It's all recorded, and I've been going over it in the last month. And I'm really happy to say that this content is also available to you. So um, you can join Narwhal Connect, and we have all of these resources available, and they're all for free. You can go to this URL to join, or you can come talk to us at the Narwhal booth, and we'll get you set up. Thank you so much, everyone.